Mine oh, was a very. Internet. You're playing Angry Birds. Here we go. <laughs> okay, I'm all excited. All right, so I guess we're all set. Um, call the meeting to order. Uh, we're being videotaped by uh, a representative of the North Street Neighborhood Association. Um, and first order of business are the minutes of the March 28th meeting. Move approval. Second. Any uh, further adjustments? I think Jim has already been over to uh, it's just a couple a, of tweaks. Yeah. A word. Okay. Yeah. Mine is two words. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, but I guess I was echoing Mike. So. <laughs> all right. All in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. 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 I'm going to abstain from that over here. Okay. Um, so I, I think maybe Mike doesn't know, but this is Chris Hellman over here. The mayor has nominated him to replace Jim on the board. Um, you can see all of us. <laughs> so I, I'm glad you came, Chris. And, uh, Looking forward to being here. Good time. Can we invite him to sit at the table with us, or would that be... Well, he, there's a, the process now that uh, he'll go through. Oh, okay, through. then I'm going to... He's not... Right. The, yeah. I, met with the, uh, I met with the committee on appointments this earlier this week, and I'm up for approval on the 19th at the city council meeting. Okay. As luck would have it, he was walking out, and I was walking down the hallway, and we met there at the approval committee. <laughs> Boy, do you have to get approval to leave? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, will you be here at the next meeting? Yeah, uh, I will. Good. Yes. Good. I told me you needed to be here to approve the budget. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's, it's uh, okay. Uh, Chris is not, I guess it's not legal until the council passes it, and then he has to be sworn in by the uh, city clerk. Right is that two meetings by city council to do also? It, Just no, one? Oh, I Two. Well, there was a reading last meeting, oh, so. Oh, then you would. Yeah. Yeah, because it was controversial when I was done at one meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. It came up and they and they voted it. Well, see what happens now. It comes up, especially if you're new, and then it's referred to committee, and committee meets with the, with the nominee and approves or disapproves, and after the mayor comes. As a recommendation. All right. So, uh, first order of business is a one year extension to contract 35811 three for Polymer to Ashland Hercules Water Technologies. Move approval. Second. second. This is uh, the second year of this contract. There is no escalator in it, so it remains the same price at 225 a pound, which was the low bid. This is Polymer for the wastewater treatment plant for the year. There's approximately sixteen thousand eight hundred and seventy-five dollars is the value of the contract. Oh. Any questions or comments? All in favor of approving this extension. Aye. All right. Next, the contract for emergency and emergency emergency action plan update for city dams to GZA Geo Environmental in the amount of twenty-nine three. Oh, cool. Second. Yes, Jim. Jimmy, what's this cover? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> in uh, 2007, we had six of these emergency action plans prepared uh, for the city's dams. They were done by GZA. Um, in February, we received, we received uh, six letters from the Office of Dam Safety requiring that we update um, these 2007 emergency action plans um, to meet uh, new FEMA standards on and that address the format and content of the plan. So there are federal guidelines for dam safety. They want to take our existing plans and, and put them into the new FEMA format. And uh, the Office of Dam Safety also had um, questions about the hydrologic, hydraulic um, information that was in each of the plans. So the, one of the things that's contained in the plan, and there, there were calculations that were the basis of determining the inundation zone. So if the dam was to fail, what area would be underwater? Um, so the uh, Office of Dam Safety had uh, questions about each one of the analysis. So the contract that we have here um, tonight that's proposed to GZA is to um, update the action plan and to uh, revise the format, respond to ODS comments, 
and also to uh, to attend meetings uh, with the city, the city's uh, emergency management coordinator, and then with the emergency management coordinators in the other towns, so Williamsburg, um, Waitley, Hatfield, um, towns where there there are property that would be inundated if one of the city stands were to fail. So I think that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So the, the final product um, will be updated plans. We're going to get hard copies and electronic copies. Um, the dam safety regulations require that contact information and other information that might be subject to change on an annual basis be updated. So you know we'll keep three ring binders, we'll have electronic copies of the reports. Annually staff will be able to update those areas that need to be updated annually and, and keep in compliance with the requirement. How long do the meetings go on? Are these one-time only meetings, or are they to be continued over several months, years? Um, under the, it would make sense to do them every year. Um, within the contract, I think there's really two, two sets of meetings planned. One would be to meet with um, emergency management coordinators in each town to review the content of the 07 plan as it exists so we can identify things that need to change. And then once the new plans are drafted and updated, we would meet with them again to review the contents of the updated plan before they're final. And then every year there should be, um, you know, there should be a meeting just to review the contents of the plan with each town. I think the Office of Dam Safety <coughs> recommends things like tabletop exercises just so that people are familiar with the contents of the plan. Did you say tabletop exercises? Right. When you get everybody in a room and you, you run through what-if scenarios about. Jim? Uh, do you have any idea of what the seven original studies cost us? Um, I don't. I was just wondering, you know, out of the, what we spent for the seven studies, how much more just to update? You know, just based on what, I mean, I think the studies were probably somewhere in the order of, you don't remember, do you? I don't know. I wasn't with the city then. I mean, just based on looking at the document, I would think they're probably about a $20,000 plan <coughs> okay. for each one. Yeah. Would be, Yes, there were a lot of calculations necessary. So the updates, you know, for each one is, you know, somewhere and going to be somewhere in the yeah. audience. Yeah, it's not, not too much. Okay. And, um, Mike, um, Jim, I noticed in the scope that they're not including an update of breach simulations or inundation mapping. Right. So will they still be able to address the, the comments that we received? I think so. They, they were looking for more, um, based on my read of the, the state's comments, they were looking for more elaboration about um, the calculations as they were done, so they don't feel like they were as fully described as they needed to be. Um, and some of it also relates to um, the hazard classification of the dams, like in the Roberts Meadows system, for example. Those dams are um, classified as high hazard dams because of the assumption, the regulations have an assumption of domino effect, so mm -hmm. one dam Dams in series, if one breaks, the assumption is that the two downstream dams will fail. And, the, and those factors go into the calculation in the inundation zone. So those were some things that were um, assumed when the, the analysis was done, but not elaborated to the detail that the Office of Dam Safety would like. So I, I felt like there wasn't a need to, um, and apparently GCA felt the same way, there wouldn't be a need to revise the calculations. Thank you. Will this in any way, um cause us to reconsider our decision about the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam? I don't think so. So the calculations, the fresh calculations of the domino effect? I don't think so. Is there a time frame in this letter? Do we have a... Uh, actually there is. There is a... Uh, they, they need to be submitted to the Office of Dam Safety within six months of February, so... There's a there's a timeline to get the work done. So that will be August. Okay, from May to August. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Six fingers on the hand. Who needs six fingers? I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Any other thoughts? All in favor of approving this contract for the emergency action plan update? Aye. 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 Okay, next is a contract for landfill maintenance construction to Jay Basin Sun in the amount of $158,000. That's cool. Yeah. Is this a one year extension? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yes, please. This is a, <coughs> this is a, a contract that we put out to bid for length and maintenance construction, and, and basically what it is is it, um, it's a contract that allows us to uh, to work with a contract to do to do maintenance related construction activities at the landfill. So, for example, if we had a a, a failure of a gas header pipe and we needed to replace it, we would contact this firm under this contract to go out and replace a section of pipe or install a new valve or repair a section of uh, landfill cap that had eroded. So it's it just gives us the ability to do construction work at the landfill for uh, miscellaneous projects that may come up. Um, so the uh, the contract amount is 158000 We don't expect that we're going to spend that. We don't really have uh, lists of projects that we want to accomplish, but we need the ability to, uh, to work with a contractor if projects come up in an emergency. So, so Why is it such an odd number? <laughs> uh, you know, we what we did is we, we assumed so many hours of a particular piece of equipment, so many linear feet of pipe, so many valves, and then once, you know, they put the bid prices on there, you add them up, and... So this is per incident, not not like a contract or a... Uh, we'd, we'd, yeah, we hire them per, per um, I don't want to call them the event, but whatever, whatever the construction item was, yeah. we'd have them mobilized to take care of that particular thing. But you will let, you call them up, let them know, then they respond. There's a possibility that we could get out of this year's contract with 58,000 yeah. instead of 158. And it's for a year. Yeah, I mean, the life will be closing within a year, so I don't expect we'll be needing it beyond that. Have been have we worked with Jay Bates before? We yeah. have. Yeah. They did the last closure project for us. Okay. Good firm, tons of experience. Um, we're happy they were low. And this is a different contractor than the one we've been using up there? This is the contractor that did the last closure project for us. Okay. Um, but we have a different operational contractor, if that's the question. So all the solutions run the landfill. Right. Yeah. So the landfill maintenance has been, who's been handling it until we started this contract? We had a contract previously with, um, Bates. No, it wasn't Bates. That was ours. It was Bates out of Clinton, Mass, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. I'm just, we're switching contractors to do that. Uh, okay. We had, a con we had a contract. Who was our fire contractor? I was trying to remember. Can you see my eyes rolling up inside my head? Yeah. <laughs> see, see the name back there? Over here? It's back you need there. one of those. Has it been a Have you said it's work done? It's been uh, a couple of years, I think. Okay. I apologize if it's the name's escaping. Okay, all in favor of approving this uh, contract? Aye. 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 Next is a contract for hydrants to EJ Prescott, the amount of $8,400. Over we'll approval. Second. That's an annual purchase of uh, hydrants we do every year for the water department to replace old ones once they get broken in accidents. Um, Things of that, we had uh, one, two, three bidders on it. A total contract price ranging from uh, $8,453.40, which is the one Prescott did to $10,000. Uh, basically, there are five to five and a half foot berry hydrants. That's the depth of burial of them. And like I said, it's just a annual contract we do each year. And we have hydrants on hand. All in favor of approving this? Aye. Aye. And then finally, contract for bituminous concrete, the FOB plants to Palmer Paving in an amount not to exceed 100000 uh, This is FOB plant um, in East Hampton, Mass. Last year we had the same contract, $100,000. It's for doing potholes and for steep cups that we do for utility repairs, could be water, sewer, drain. Uh, the price did go up quite a bit, it went up to 10% from last year. Last year was 72 a ton, this year it's 79 times. All in favor of approving this kind of Aye. 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 Now the budget. So this is the FY13 budget. Yep. 
Uh, basically, the, the Board of Public Works has been meeting in small non quorum groups. The next group is going to meet tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. That should, I think, be our last meeting on that. And uh, uh, we're prepared to uh, pass the budget on the April 25th meeting of the Board of Public Works. The reason that date is critical is the uh, City Council needs the Mayor's budget the first week in May. And so it's critical we wrap this process up. On general, there's not huge amounts of changes from last year's budgets uh, and percentages that we're looking at uh, to keep current with our thought of our, our comprehensive wastewater management plan, our water asset management plan, and the work that we know is coming down the road that is in the very near future. And uh, keeping those rates there so we have that money available for those necessary repairs that are coming to us. Um, the solid waste one's a little trickier this year because the landfill is closing mid-year. Uh, the subcommittee, the board, is still trying to make some recommendations that hopefully they'll be brought up tonight for discussion also uh, as to how we move forward with uh, things of uh, residential fee sticker programs to uh, maybe the Glendale Road transfer station, what's going to happen out there to other things. Um, so that'll be carried under informational number one. So, uh, like I said, the last meeting um, is scheduled for tomorrow. If the board needs more information or more uh, small non quorum meetings, we'll be happy to host those uh, so that you can uh, fully understand the budget. Aside from appreciating how the budget's constructed, <laughs> are there any um, decisions in the budget that, that you would think of as policy issues? I wouldn't say policy issues. It's a matter of obviously we're waiting for the asset management plans to be completed. That will be a guiding principle, I think, for the board going forward as to how we prioritize what we're going to be working on next. Um, and maybe that document becomes your policy. At this point, um, stormwater related expenses are just. Come out of the general fund. They are coming out of the general fund. It's a very small, as you probably remember, three fiscal years ago, we cut out $62,000 out of that account for a budget, uh, budget cut. That money went into capital projects for stormwater, so we deleted that. Um, obviously, you know that the stormwater <coughs> report that we're working on, the asset management report, hopefully will be completed this month. That's been uh, Jim and I's goal to get that completed so that we'll have that document to review and how we might move forward with uh, stormwater management in the city overall and flood control. And how about uh, recreation? Right now the general fund is level funded, about even recreation. I do have concerns about Florence Fields coming online with no additional budget for that. So I do have some concerns about the future. Um, it would be nice also to work with Bernadette Gibbons who was here at the last meeting and work on some organic turf management on city parks. Uh, we started looking at Lamprin Park, and then I came to the realization that all we do is mow that park. <coughs> we actually don't put any kind of uh, uh, fertilizers on it. So we're seeking another park with Bernadette right now that we may be able to cost exchange the use of fertilizers and any pesticides to uh, organic. But in terms of... Um Well, I guess actually the city council gave us the money for recreation, or under Claire's, um, oh, not regime, what am I looking for? Administration. Administration, <laughs> yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 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 under, uh, right. under her administration, um, we, cut, we cut the recreation out one year, and then... Did. Three years ago, we were asked to take a 12% budget cut, and with that budget cut was about a $450,000 cut we had to find, and one of the things that was looked at right off the bat was what essential services the DPW provides to the city, even though we thought that recreation is vital to a community, it is not essential. It's not public safety. So we had actually, as part of the major budget cut, was completely uh, taking apart and putting away the recreation department. Which I'm glad did not happen. Right. Oh, clearly. But, um, 
So we've been level since then. We've been level funded for the past two years. But you don't see any policy issues in terms of how we take that, that level pot of money. Your status, I mean, we're obviously shrinking everywhere. Well, my concern of it too is that uh, besides the morale issue of you know, raises for individuals also, um, and if we do give raises, that means we have to cut services to the city before level funded. So it's a kind of a, a, a catch-22 of what we do here. And we, all, we want to provide level services, but at some point, if we keep you know, a 0% increase, the services are going to decline, and the city's going to decide what services they want to decrease to the citizens, whether it be recreation or storm water or uh, public safety. I mean, there's a lot of schools. There's a lot of things. The DPW general fund is quite small. It's only about $3.1 million. When you look at the overall $75, $80 million budget of the city, it's a pretty small amount. Even though the DPW has about $20 million in budget overall with the solid waste, the water, and sewer enterprise funds, the general side is quite small for the second largest department in the city. Uh, Dave Narcos actually did a budget presentation. It's online. It's actually pretty helpful and it's it's graphic, so it shows mm -hmm. you know what percentage of the general fund goes to public works, and, and it's a, a pretty good baseline for us to be looking at as we start thinking about our stuff. I also think there's other initiatives in the city that we need to be mindful of. There's this Green Streets initiative <coughs> that's you know. Um, there's this concern about the canopy in town, the shade trees, and yeah. what's going on with that. It feels like there's a lot of energy sort of circulating around things that I'm, I find out about because I read in the paper, and it feels like it comes to bear here in our budget process. And I, I'm concerned that we don't, we aren't aware of all those sort of other things that are circling yeah. around that could impact our budget that seem to be good green energy, but there's a financial reality to those. I worry that they're not in front of us. Yeah, it's, it strikes me that these level-funded years are not, probably not temporary. I don't see us suddenly being back in the gravy. And I wonder if eventually there will be policy issues where we have to, <clears throat> I'm not trying to single out of recreation, but I mean, at some point we're going to have to start, in some sense, rethinking where our money goes. Mm -hmm. I, I, we, we can't just keep nibbling away at every line item, but leaving the line item alone, other than the nibbles. Well, we do have some larger concerns, too, with the Army Corps of Engineers for the work that needs to be done on our levy system in the next two years. Uh, the engineering estimate for that uh, uh, engineering gap, uh, data gap analysis is up to $500,000 that would come out of the general fund. Uh, there's also um, work that needs to be done on that could be done by city staff, as long as we have the staff to support it. And also the end store permit on the stormwater side that's coming up is going to cost probably a hundred plus thousand dollars a year to implement that program. That's another mandate coming down. And these are all funded by the general fund at this point. So we had a long discussion with the mayor and, and Susan Wright, the business manager, about that earlier uh, this week, <coughs> on Monday actually, and made some suggestions how we go forth with those projects. It's um, waiting to hear back from them. <coughs> I think I see your point, Carrie. I mean, there's, there's only you can only nibble so much before the whole thing breaks. You know, sort of a, sort of a house of cards or, or what it is. But at some point, you're going to reach a point where you can't provide a certain level of service or a certain service anymore because you, you've cut it down to such bare bones that. And um, I think that's the tension, you know, right now with the with the budget because we haven't we haven't really cut anything per se from what we do, but every year in recent times. You know, there's a, there's a lesser amount of money to do it. So at some point, you're going to reach a point where um, there's going to have to be some type of conversation with the city as a whole to say, there's been a reduction in revenue for, for a certain amount of time, and, you know, we're going to lose so many people, and you're not going to be able to do certain things. And that's just the reality of it. And I, and I don't think there's been a lot of hard discussions, other than the one that Ned mentioned there a couple of years ago when we were talking about um, gutting out the entire recreation department, which is, you know, it was, it's a good conversation to have because I really think that's where things are, 
film you can only squeeze so much before something gets squeezed right out of existence. Well, I, I think we've already we're already there if you think about the condition of the roads, and and this comes up annually as part of this discussion. And do you do you fund recreation and and limp along with the roads? And that's what we've been doing. But as we all know, the condition of the roads doesn't decrease in a linear method. It it sort of drops off after a while. And, um, we've we've done a great job, I think, with crack sealing, trying to hold together what we have, but. That will only last so long. So I think it's a good discussion to have, but it it certainly is beyond I think this group of people to, to make that decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mike Mike's talking about roadways, and one of the things I started to look at is on the low volume roads we go back to chip sealing rather than asphalt overlays. You know, cost wise is fairly cheap on the dollar, but they only have a lifespan of seven to ten years, while asphalt you know twelve to fifteen years. But the cost is a quarter of it, so actually. It's life cycle cost is a lot cheaper than asphalt. You just do it more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, I know you look to the rural communities; they still do chip sealing out there in those in those towns. Well, it certainly wouldn't help for it and hurt on the secondary roads, anyways. Yeah. So, but, <coughs> but now we're chip sealing stone and, and asphalt. <coughs> yeah, yeah, asphalt and stone. Okay. And so you know, basically, we went from two years ago, a twenty-four, actually a year and a half ago, a twenty-four million dollar backlog of paving to thirty-six million now because we just haven't kept up and the roads are just falling off the curve from a mill and overlay uh, type situation to reconstruction now. Um, we rely strictly on Chapter 90 funds uh, and nothing else, which is not enough to maintain what we have. And uh, we've been trying to do some maintenance with the crack ceiling. We've put about a half million into the streets over the past five years. We're actually getting caught up. This year's contract will probably only be about Sixty to seventy thousand dollars worth of streets to be done, so we're starting to see that decrease in that. But um, we still don't have an adequate program for paving operations. Well, I, mean, I don't remember from our budget talk. Uh, maybe we didn't address it. How? What is the plan for the um, foreign fields? My understanding is that there's been park grants that have been provided to create the first fields mm -hmm. down there. There's some infrastructure improvements going on now with sidewalks and fencing and uh, bringing water and sewer into the site, things of that nature. From the CPA? It was um, CPA and a park grant, PARC, I think they call it. Oh, right, right, the state. Right, I yeah. think that was a half million dollar park grant. But that continued into this year. I don't know the specifics of the grant that went to uh, mm -hmm. Office of Planning and Development and Recreation, mm -hmm. not us. Right, right. But when is our contribution? When the, fields, when the fields get built, they'll have to start being maintained. Yeah. That would be a year from now. So when are the first fields being built? I think this summer. They're going to start building the fields and seeding them. And, uh, but then they make a sit up. Don't you have to let... They'll like, make they sit for... Us, they might sit for a year or two, but they're still going to be mowed and maintained to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, many of us may have seen the article that about Amherst putting aside maybe four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars this year to do some paving after they spent four million dollars last sure. year. And I and I compare that number to our recreation budget, which is only two hundred and twenty five thousand. So here we're talking about well maybe we should, you know, switch our focus from maintaining the fields to maintaining the streets and we, we still wouldn't even come close to what another community nearby is spending to maintain their streets. It just kind of the kind of <laughs> puts it in perspective. I don't, I don't know how they do it over there. The roads are terrific. In they sure are. Yeah. Well, I, I would be lax if I didn't voice my main concern. And uh, that's flood control. Uh, we have a study, Corps of Engineers, uh, and they cited some deficiencies that we have. And certainly we know uh, that we have engines down there that are were installed in 1940. Two have to be replaced. You can't get parts for them. And I'll tell you, the in, in, nobody has to tell you that the intensity of the storms we have has increased. I mean, all you have to do is look at it. 
what we get in two hours now when a rainstorm used to be a 48-hour storm. It's no longer that way. And with the flood control system that we have, we're having all we can do to keep up. And if anything happens to one of those engines down there, the lower portion of the city of North Hampton is going to be underwater. And, uh, you know, we have got to do something. That capital improvement budget has got to replace those two engines down there. And it's, 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 not, even, it's not even to the point of being funny anymore. Well, we've been putting in for the Indians on flood control for 12 years that I've been here. I know we have. And last year they funded $50,000 for engineering study work to be done. I decided to wait until we get the stormwater report done first before we invest that 50000 at this point because it might all roll together out of that report anyways. Mm -hmm. And we'll need that money at that point for a larger scale levy project also. But, but I think there's another avenue that we ought to be looking at right now. We know there's no money in the city. Mm -hmm. And we ought to be looking at a political um, answer to this. And we should be uh, lobbying our state senators and our federal people for monies to put into uh, the federal programs to bring it back to the states so that we can get it into uh, the type of things that we we really have to do. We can't let it go. I know we can. Yeah, when the uh, when Irene was um, came up the valley last year. Uh, when they put the uh, the boards in yep. down by Smith, and the, the pumps were running during the storm. Yes. Um, <coughs> let's say the one down by the bowling alley at the dike on Route Five uh, were to fail. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Is was that was that pumping full force during that, or was it really not quite? No, it wasn't. Needed. What happened was the, you know, we had that intense rainstorm of about four and a half inches of rain or so, which we were supposed to get, I think, between five and ten. So we were really lucky out in that regard. But I don't think they actually had fully all three pumps running at that point. I think they had two with one as an alternate backup. That system will pump out about 150,000 gallons of water a minute out of the city. It's quite a strong pumping system, but... Um, you know, the Mill River was the river that was flashing the most, and the Mill River actually has a diversion around the city so it doesn't come through. Right. So we we're strictly dealing with city drainage only and not the Mill River. Um, Connecticut River always has a surge that takes two to three days after a major event to really peak itself. <coughs> and that's when uh, you really start seeing our pump station coming online is as the Connecticut's rising and we can't get the water out by gravity. So we're the, the pump down by the... <coughs> Bowling out of the bike. Mm -hmm. Where does it draw? What's, what's the source of its water? The old Mill River bed. That's where most all the downtown city drains goes into is the old Mill River bed okay. that ends up at the wastewater treatment plant. And they pump and it runs out of that, the side of it. You know, they pump out of that channel and through the flood wall because the Kennedy River is this high and they can't go gravity, so they push right. it through. And we've done some GIS work on the uh, uh, flood walls, if they were to fail, we based it on the elevation of the floods of 36 and 38. And I'm trying to remember how many hundreds of properties downtown and how many billions of dollars of potential damage could occur if they did fail. It's huge. Well, during, what was it, 36, 37, they had uh, water on Strong Avenue that was they like did. eight feet deep. So. I think the the peak of the 36th flood was 129 feet. Does that yeah. sound right? That's correct. I know that um, kind of facilities, that's more or less the ground level. It's about 128 feet. So there'd be a foot of water there. But if you go up over the hill past Forbes and down to downtown, I think it's lower than 129. Yeah, all of Con Street would be on there. Mm -hmm. well, it yeah. goes to show you that the building of the dike system has really saved the lower portion of the city of Northampton because in 1987 the Connecticut River elevation came to 129. Well, it, 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 was it 129 or 121? In, in 1984 it 84. came up to 121, I think. Or 121 yeah. or 122. Yeah, 84 is, was the low, well, if you go to the, the old Johnson property on Hockenham Road in Hadley, 
they just redid their sign. And I don't know if it actually gives the elevation. Mm -hmm. But 84 is the one at the bottom of the post and the 36 way up at the top. Yeah, we, we keep the elevations of the Connecticut River and we have a, a record from 1945 on the high water elevation of every month. Yeah. And uh, we actually distribute that to, to some of the marinas who ask for it or want it. You know, so that they can keep track of what's going on. Me being Board of Public Works? Yeah. So just so you know, the flood control has a budget of about $50,000 a year total between overtime costs for running the pump station and $32,000 for maintenance. So it's a pretty small budget for such a big need that we have that's ongoing right now. But um, like I said, it has been identified to the man, the business manager. We're trying to figure out how we fund the work that the Army Corps is requiring us to do in the next two years and how we, you know, deal with the whole levy support system around the city and the diversion channel and work that needs to be done. We're talking about that stormwater study being completed. When is that going to be done? We believe by the end of the month it will be done. This month? Yes. So is it fair to say at this point your approach to the budget is to basically almost fully fund everything that we have been doing, less the inevitable impact of being level funded? Well, pretty much when we have some projects on the enterprise funds, there's some miscellaneous projects here and there that we'll, we've gone over, like um, uh, industrial park sewer line extension needs to be done. Uh, that line is at capacity right now. That's a million dollar construction project. The board did approve a design contract with uh, SEA, I think two months ago or so on that. Uh, every budget has the same, the water sewer enterprise fund has the same amount of money set aside for water line and sewer line replacement projects as we do a project every year. We try to set aside that money. And then there's the, any extra money is being set aside for these long-term plans. Uh, I know some of us have read the draft reports from the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan and the work that needs to go on down at the wastewater treatment plant. It's in pretty sad shape down there. It's it's, out, it's served its useful life down there at this point. I'm th I guess I'm thinking more of the general fund side. Of oh, the general fund? Uh, the, it's, it's level funded where we had to take things out where uh, we assumed a 20% increase in diesel and fuel costs. So with that, that decreased things like buying rakes and hose. And it's, it's so it's your opinion that we haven't reached the point where we need to sacrifice a this in order to do a better job at that. Well, we're making little sacrifices here and there, and Jim hit the nail on the head. At some point, the uh, house of cards falls down. And we, we're not there yet, but if we keep going at 0%, and cost of living expenses keep going up, gasoline, purchasing of rakes, hose, gloves, or whatever, at some point, it will break. Oh, okay. um, one of the things that was that I've noticed over the couple of years is, is that the in an effort to make good use of all our resources that there's a real integration in the enterprise funds and the general funds and the staffing. And how do we how do we conceptualize the disappearance or the evaporation of the solid waste enterprise fund and how that might impact our ability to sustain operations? The board has to make that, or the city has to make that decision to eliminate the enterprise fund at this point. Okay, but we're going to see it diminish. You can see it diminish training. dramatically, um, especially on the, on the, well, obviously the revenue side, but also the operational side, the cost of running mm -hmm. the facilities. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a conversation with the mayor at, at some point. Maybe it makes sense that you take all that and package it and put it into the general fund. Uh, until 2000, that's how the landfill was run, was out of the general fund. And maybe at some point it becomes so small it actually goes back to the general fund and everything's paid out of it. We don't have the answer for that yet. I think um, over the course of the years the landfill closes and we start getting used to our new system of waste management. I think that story will tell itself out in the next year or two. Dave, how about putting the leftover money in the building, the new building? That. I assume could be done. I think that would be a board decision and a conversation with the mayor to make that happen. Well, I think we ought to make it a priority. Well, it's not 
clear how much leftover money there would be. It's, mm -hmm. it's not apt to be the kind of leftover quantity that would take a big bite out of the building. Well, I don't know how big a bite <coughs> would be sufficient. Right, we're still back together. We are still working on the numbers on the solid waste division. The water and sewer are, are pretty close, I think, to being finalized at this point. I think after tomorrow morning, we'll have a pretty solid idea, but there are some some unknown areas in the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund that still need some discussion and board votes as to how we proceed or board uh, um, recommendations. Yeah. Well, so no action required, it's just a, Not this evening. Just a discussion. Mike? Well, I did have a comment earlier. You asked about what policy issues are in here, and, and certainly on the water and sewer enterprise accounts, we established a policy of uh, routine rate increases for the next few years, and those are those are built in here. Right. And, um, in one case, in, uh, one case we're, we're trying to catch up so that we have enough revenue to cover our expenses, and that's on the water side, I guess, and then on the wastewater side, the, the, the policy is to increase the rates gradually so that when all the new projects come along that it will be required, we will be in a better position to fund them. Yeah. So so those are policy issues that are built in. That we established last year. Yeah, right. Still right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. On the, on the um, flood pumps, do we have any information, and did the Army inspection give us any information on the condition of the pumps and the lifetime of the pumps, separate from the engines, the, you know, the pumps? Well, the, the pumps themselves, I mean, they don't see many hours a year of use. They might run, on average, maybe 100 hours a year. The problem is that you can't buy a part for them now. And if they break, we're literally, we can't pump water. Uh, the, pumps, uh, the pumps themselves are manufactured, I think, by working. They're, ster they're sterling engines. And the engines are sterling. The engines are, that's what we cannot get parts for is the engines yeah, that yeah. drive the pumps. I think we can still get Worthington Worthington parts, or the parts are machinable. You know, a, an impeller, a volute, uh, those things are machinable. But when you get the engine parts... We, we do have one diesel engine down there that was replaced, I think, 17 years ago. When one, of the, when one of the Sterlings failed. So we do have one that is fairly modern that we can get parts for and repair. But those two Sterlings are, something happens, 1940, and you you've lost two-thirds of your capacity of pumping water out of the city. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the bad part about it is uh, that if you hear these engines run, you say to yourself, oh, geez, those are beautiful engines. And they are. But if they fail, you can't get a part for them. So it's a... It's a but we have, and we have two of those pumps. We have two are of them. Are they identical? Yep. Identical. And there's three total and one is a non-sterling that's 17 years old. Yeah. yeah. One is a Caterpillar? One's a Caterpillar. Diesel yeah. engine. Diesel. Okay. Good talk. So we'll see something next tomorrow morning. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Next is uh, the discussion and probably approval of the sewer discharge fees. At a previous board meeting, we had presented a draft uh, memorandum from the point called the SCA in regard to updated calculations <coughs> regarding DOD uh, surcharge, city charges for certain uh, quality wastewater. And it also proposed um, implementation of a new total suspended solid surcharge. Um, the memorandum, as it was originally drafted, was based on calculations that SCA had done based um, basically um, <laughs> calculating what the increased operational costs are in terms of manpower, um, electricity, solids disposal, um, those sorts of factors went into the calculation. And um, After the draft was presented, we received some feedback from board members about 
um, making sure that we were accounting for all factors, uh, thinking that simply covering our operational cost doesn't cover all the costs associated with um, our owning and operating the plant. So we uh, provided those comments back uh, to SEA and asked them to, to take a look at uh, other factors that may be applicable to the surcharge. Um, so we received an update from 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 them about uh, about the surcharges, and they've added uh, a capital equipment replacement factor for dewatering and aeration equipment. Um, they, they've stated that the factor amortizes the cost to replace the plant equipment in use over the 20 year life cycle, and attributes that to ponds of sludge handled or cubic foot of air use. So they're taking into some of the capital costs associated with the plant operation. In addition, um, they were suggesting that we, uh, we increase a charge, another charge that we, uh, we, we attribute to Coca-Cola and is related to um, staff time associated with sampling, taking wastewater samples for BOD analysis and doing the laboratory work and um, mon you know, so the monitoring and compliance costs associated with that. So right now we, we bill Coke $600 a month for these sampling events that our staff at the wastewater plant do. And, um, SCA did a full accounting of what those current costs are, and they, they came up with a, a value of $3,100 per month for the sampling, and currently we charge $600 a month for, for that sampling. So um, I had sent by emails sort of late in the day. I don't know if anybody had a chance to take a look at it. There was a track changes copy of the memorandum that, uh, that summarized what these changes were, and uh, the recommendations now are uh, based on their calculations, that the DOD surcharge rate be increased to $33.06 per 100 pounds of DOD. From, from what was the original? $22.77. Okay. And they were uh, suggesting that the TSS surcharge be implemented at a rate of $40.84 per 100 pounds of TSS. Uh, and there had not been a previous rate. And then the last recommendation was to, uh, to increase the monthly sampling charge from $600 a month to $3,110 per month. So we'll, we'll bring that forward to the board uh, based on the update of the memo uh, for consideration. Right. I'd like to make a motion to approve the rates. <coughs> Second. And I think Rowan has a comment. Um, I was wondering. Uh, all that seemed reasonable. I thought before it was good. How much of this is? I would. Coke has been very um, supportive about this and, and very um, open. But do they have an inkling about the extreme, especially the monitoring charge from six hundred to three one hundred? Do they know that that's coming down the pike? We haven't talked to them about the sampling charge. Um, we, we have had. Um, some discussions with them about the, the changes to the DOD surcharge and the implementation of the TSS surcharge, and they seem more than willing and amenable to, to pay for these costs. I, I think they realize that it's obviously a cost that the city's incurring related to, uh, that's attributable, attributable to their activity. Mm -hmm. So um, I think they've been fine um, with the whole concept. And, yeah, but, but in our meeting with the mayor, that certainly seemed to be the the message they were giving us. They understand they're causing us a problem, mm -hmm. and they're quite willing to trade money for some leniency. Right, plus we had the representative here. Yeah. But I just was wondering about the sampling and monitoring charge. Well, the sampling and, excuse me, the sampling and monitoring charge is a charge that will be continuous. It won't go away. I, no, no, no that, matter. that they were prepared for that one. I understand. Yeah. So it's right. not just a one-time thing. Yeah. It's, it's continuous. Yeah. yeah. And, and we sample 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Yeah. That, that starts to answer my question. I was wondering if, if we sample um, other dischargers and whether or not we charge them for sampling. And it may be just the intensity of the sampling that makes this a separate case. We do not. Uh, sample other dischargers unless there is a problem, but they are required to sample and they use Tiger Bond or someone else to do a, a quarterly or whatever the sampling right, that's is. How, that's how we do our pre treatment program yeah, based on that. under the so pre treatment program, and they pay for that. Could Coca Cola use their own consultant to do the sampling? Or? No. no. 
So what followed on, and I had I had the same concern about whether or not they'd been exposed to this this big increase. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the the policy, the first time I read it uh, a month or so ago, I thought was good because it could be applied to any discharger to the mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. and and it we weren't singling out a particular company. And then with the addition of this sampling charge, we really zero in on Coke. And and I wondered if there was a way to um, either make make the policy more generic um, so that it could be applied to other dischargers if there became a need. It or, is. Not, not the sampling piece. The, only the sampling piece is the only part that is not. Right. Uh, I agree. I and I was wondering if, if, since the rest of the policy is generic and could be applied to any discharger, whether there was a way we could make the monitoring piece generic um, and be able to apply it to any discharger. I think we can do that. I think that uh, even we do it because of necessity with Coke. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, and and we did it for um, Montam Packaging Packaging Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, at one time, uh, their discharge was such that we sampled them more than what the normal was, mm -hmm. uh, and they have since put in a treatment system. And their discharge is down to uh, no violations at all, ever. So um, we don't continue to sample them, but, but we did. Okay, Ned has some. Yeah, the, only, <clears throat> the only other one that we do regular monitoring of is Williamsburg. <clears throat> we do that at the tunneling station. We have a composite sampler up there. It's more of a, a weekly sample, a monthly sample here and there. Mm -hmm. But it's not the level that we exercise here at Coca-Cola. Jim? I was going to say that if, if you wanted to, you could, uh, one way to potentially deal with it would be to approve the BOD and TSS surcharges separately, and then um, you could consider another motion possibly that would give the staff the flexibility to determine the cost incurred in sampling and charge, charge the users as appropriate to cover that cost. And then we could calculate them on a case-by-case -case basis on the amount of time that we spend resources doing that. Because it's, you know, I think it's, it might make a good point in terms of equity to charge and coke to do these sorts of things. Granted, it's a much larger level of effort, but um, you know, in terms of equity, if we're doing it in other locations. Okay. Do we have a sense of how these increases in charges will impact um, what percentage increase coke is facing? From the meeting we had with Coca-Cola, <clears throat> this is based on the document that was uh, put out two weeks ago. Those price structures, they thought it would be about $85,000 a year to the city. Before so there's been the increases from two weeks ago when you last, or actually it was four weeks ago, I believe. There's been some increase in that, so it could be a percentage more of up to uh, in excess of $100,000 a year. So, so I guess what I'm trying to understand is, for Coke, from Coke's point of view, if their water bill or whatever bill they're getting from us is a hundred dollars now, what we're looking, what what percentage increase are we talking about it being with these new charges implemented? Do we know? Well, they, we don't know. Um, it'll be a fraction though, because if you it look at it, won't be a hundred percent increase. No, it won't be. Particularly if you look at their overall bill, we're we're talking just about the surcharge on their bill. I'm just trying to get a sense of scale in terms of how it's impacting. Right. Them. So there. So. Um, one, one bit of information here. So on the BOD surcharge rate, the increase that's proposed in the surcharge rate is, is 45%. But again, we're talking about an increase on the surcharge rate, which is this portion of the bill that can be this big. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't calculated what the overall percentage would be in terms of the, the impact of their monthly their monthly yeah. That increase fluctuates with the strength of discharge that they give us. Mm -hmm. So if their strength is down, the increase is down. Yeah, I guess I'm just yeah. curious is, is that if it's a major, you know, if it's large enough to incentivize them to really take care of it in-house so it's not impacting our operation. Well, oh, yes. It's, uh, and the surcharge itself does that. Uh, what we found, it, what we found in the reason for the increase is 
with the sure charge has paid now, it's not covering our costs. So, yeah. Well, the main incentive is that we've told them that we can't continue to take this type of discharge from the normal one. Mm -hmm. So that's a business risk for, for them. We just can't handle it. Um, they, they had asked at one point if we could efficiently handle this level of discharge at the plant and send them a bill to handle it, then they would be fine with that. But because our plant is stressed out to the maximum and running at capacity, we can't really continue to allow our capacity to be spent. A, a good portion of the capacity only related to treating their discharge. Mm -hmm. So they're on a, they're on a schedule to, to deal with the BOD and TSS to knock it down to levels that will allow us to have some additional capacity at our plant for the other things in town. So there's plenty of incentive, I think, for them to, to get something done this year. And if they continue to discharge at that particular rate, it may cause the wastewater treatment plant to violate their discharge permit and what we discharge into the Connecticut River. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, is there any, are there any new technologies um, that would allow auto sampling and measuring to happen sort of real time where you, um, you know, run electric current through the discharge and it measures something. I, you know, I, I, I know there are technologies that can do certain things like that to measure water quality in real time as opposed to sending somebody out, yep, get the sample, the drive back, run it through the chemical analysis. Yeah. Nothing that I've seen. Yeah. Well, I know. I, yeah. I just know there are things that can, but it depends on what you're looking for, I suppose. Well, yeah, because if you're talking $3,100 a month, it seems like you're approaching an you could You could system. buy a pretty sophisticated yeah, system, right? It's not, a, it's not a great surrogate for a biological oxygen demand test. Right. Uh, I mean, it's just it's one of those things that... Yeah. And there's, there's I mean, I was pretty sure that was going to be the answer, but... There's things fluctuate so much that the span of their equipment would have to be so great for being very good. That's my thing. Yeah. 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 I like Jim's uh, proposed amendment. I do too. Except you can't make it. I will. Who made the original? I did. I will make a motion to uh, approve. Well, first of all, we have to retract that. Does, that, does that require a vote? I think it does. Yeah, okay. Could we make two motions? So yeah. first, first we're going to vote the down the motion on the floor. Together. Say that again. We're going to vote we're going to vote down the motion that you made. Yes. Okay. So all in favor of Jim's motion? No. no. All opposed? No. I am opposed. <laughs> 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 all right. Now, Jim. Okay. Now I, yeah. I would make a motion to approve uh, the SCA recommendation minus the sampling fee. Second. All right, so it's a motion to approve the uh, BOD and the suspended yes, solids yeah. fees, yes. monthly fees, yes. or unit fees. All in favor of approving the fees? Aye. 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 Too soon? No. Okay. But, but I think we now have a motion to... Go ahead. Why don't you finish with that, and then I'll ask I'll <laughs> your question. I don't want to get that. It, well, but are, we, are we drifting off course here? No, the one thing that we didn't talk about was the implementation of the fees. So it might be a good time to talk about that. Do you want them to be retroactive for the first of the year? Or do you want them to be applied starting in the, to the next monthly bill? Retroactive to the first of the year because we waited since 1995 to do this. Well, there's the discussions so began the back in November and December. Why did you, when did they come online with their new... I think the problem really was around the first of the year. I mean, they came online last fall, last summer fall, and then we're going through a lot of startup operations. But, um, you know, it was really December, January time frame when we started seeing the, the high levels of TSS. And they notified us back just before the turn of the year that they would not be able to make. Um, okay. So they affirmatively contacted us and said that they would... Yeah, they made yeah, they, they, they notified us formally that they would not be able to um, achieve the levels of discharge that we were all hoping for. How much 
I make a motion that we uh, put these into effect uh, beginning with the next billing cycle. Second. Any any discussion? No. I, I would like to discuss this a little bit. Uh, um, Coca Cola knew and discussed with us the increase above and beyond what they had agreed to discharge. And they have said, at least I believe from the conversations that I've heard, they have said that they're willing to pay for what uh, they're causing the wastewater treatment plant to do. And the wastewater treatment plant has had to work overtime and it's cost us a great deal of money. It's yeah. cost us perhaps ten thousand dollars so far this year. It's been, I think it's more than that. Yeah. So uh, I, I not unreimbursed ten thousand. I it's more than that. I would uh, I would like to see it go back to the first of the year so that we could recoup the costs that we've already spent. I put that line on the table simply because I appreciate the fact that they notified us in advance, mm -hmm. and I think that it's uh, worthy of us to try to work collaboratively with our major industries in town. <coughs> well, I, oh, I certainly understand that. Uh, so I'm, Mike, happy to, I'm, to, I'm happy to receive well, mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking, obviously, because I seconded I was thinking along the same lines that that it, I, I just question whether it's fair play to retroactively charge someone more after they've incurred the Coke, Coca-Cola has incurred a cost and now we're going back Big and saying, they've already paid us some cost and now we're saying, oh, it's actually higher. And at some point, I think the burden's on us to update our costs routinely. And so this caught us by surprise, you know. I, so I, it's it's an issue of fair play in my, my view. Now, it the sting comes out of it if if they're willing to reimburse the city for the costs as they say they are, then it, it, it's not quite the same situation, but um, that's why I seconded the motion. So your, the motion is that the uh, new billing goes into effect in May? With the next billing cycle, yes. It's a quarterly or monthly? Monthly. monthly. You do that every month. No further discussion? How about splitting the difference? Like February or March? Well, I, I, that, that's that was information that hadn't stuck in these little gray cells. They stuck in yours, but not mine. <laughs> but they were, had expressed a willingness to cover that cost. I just really appreciate the fact that they notified us in advance and have been working constructively with us. And well, we can respond to, we can, if your motion doesn't succeed, we can propose the fact that we appreciate this, mm -hmm. but we feel like that we can be responsive to when they were um, first brought it up. Mm -hmm. Jim? They've been good to work with, but it wasn't like they went out of their way to notify us. We do all the monitoring through the course of the month anyway, so we were well aware of the problem. Um, we did have a meeting with them in December to discuss the fact that they presented us with the fact that they wouldn't be able to meet the discharge permit when it's coming up into the next year. We were getting ready to, you know, it was the time frame to issue them a new permit for the next calendar year. So it was a conversation that needed to happen, but it was clear just based on the data that we had that, you know, they weren't anywhere near meeting the discharge permit. So, yeah, they contacted us, but it wasn't a revelation for us because we knew that there was a problem. Yeah. But, I mean, my point is well taken, too, that we haven't updated our numbers in a significant time, that yeah. the rates that we were looking to charge them for that access I, I think weren't true, true to our costs as they stand now. I was going to say that there would be no reason to do a total suspended solid surcharge if you look at that. If you disregard the BOD increase, mm -hmm. there's really no reason to have a total suspended surcharge. I mean, I, I'd be hard pressed to come up with another community that has one because mm -hmm. it's so rare to be getting this type of discharge mm -hmm. into your sewer system. So it would to think that the city would be forward thinking to have one of these surcharges when there's you'd never have no need for it. There's no need for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the <coughs> motion on the floor is that uh, we ask them to begin paying the new improved rates uh, beginning in May. 
and all in favor of that motion? Aye. All opposed to that motion? Aye. 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 Okay, so that motion <laughs> fails. <laughs> you got that recorded? <laughs> Fail. <laughs> all right, now so we need a new motion. Um, I make a motion that we uh, put the effect, the rates into effect as of the January 1st, 2012 billing date. I second that motion. Okay. Would it be detrimental to take this increased surcharge and present it to Coke and have a conversation with them before we set the date? It's entirely up to you. You know, in my opinion, you know, it's, I don't think this amount of money breaks a big company. I worked in the private sector a long time. No, I, it's I a, and it's a cost that we're incurring. I mean, that's the other thing to look at. When we talk, when we had a conversation with Coke in the mayor's office, you know, the, the general manager for Coke said, geez, you know, that, that represents this amount of money for the company. And I said, well, I said, it's interesting because it represents the exact same amount of money for the city. <laughs> so, you know, someone needs to pay for it, and that's what you're talking about. <laughs> Oh, the Coke is they, the same they, as the dollar. Yeah. <laughs> they bought okay. on to the concept and they agreed to the concept that they owe the city money based on the, the value of work that's done above and beyond a certain limit of BOD and TSS, and they were willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And these are our actual costs of dealing with that waste stream from them. Yeah. So, so we're, really, we're voting whether to eat the $15,000. Well, I, I was just going to, I think. The fact that they brought it up is reason enough. Some of our concern about expense, maybe we can uh, talk about in terms of the next motion, which is something we have we may not address with them, and that's so we can take into consideration. But this has really already been on the table, and um, it's not a surprise to them. So. Okay, so the motion is to make these uh, new BOD and suspended solid um, unit costs retroactive to the 1st of January. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Okay. <clears throat> now the next motion would be to give staff um, the authority to set the administrative and sampling costs as needed on a case-by-case -case basis. Right? Make a motion that we do that and that, that would become effective on July 1st, 2012. July 1st. Okay. Searching for a second on that. Did you restate that? I make a motion that we allow the staff to set the monitoring and sampling cost. Increase. Increase. Uh, we already have a cost. Yes. And it's been applied forever and a day, so we don't want to change that until the date you're going to. Yes. Okay. So just maybe is the word. Yeah. Because there is a six hundred dollars. Six hundred dollars a um, month sampling fee right now. Yeah. Yes. But that the increase to the suggested rate of thirty one hundred. Yeah. Ten. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're look we're looking for the generic version of the motion. That's right. As per Mike's thought, that this should be something that can be applied to other. Mm -hmm. People sure. contribute to our system. Mike, you make the motion. <laughs> well, well it, it isn't that that particular fee. It feels like it is not just for Coca Cola. It's for anyone. it's for anyone. I, I mean, if we have to sample anyone else, on a the concept of the fee is the same, but not the value mm -hmm. of the fee. Yeah, so this is broken out into a monthly fee, and it could be a weekly fee depending upon the and all the plan for the, the user. It's all based on the number of hours that are to, to that user, the amount of sampling, the lab costs. It's going to vary week to week, month to month, and right. to client to client. So we're essentially like giving the staff the authority to <clears throat> make those adjustments and calculate those charges on a case-by-case -case basis. I make that motion and that they become effective first billing cycle after they are so calculated. I second that motion. All in favor of Michael's motion? Aye. 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 No one's opposed. All right. <laughs> Nicely done. <sighs> Jeff.
Jim, does that <laughs> seem to... <laughs> what have we done, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of math. <laughs> a lot of as, math for him. <laughs> as a sewer user, I'm happy. <laughs> um, but but we'll, we will be discussing this with him. Okay, last is a solid waste planning. Uh, before we get off of this, of course, <laughs> I, I'm a little confused on this because in our pre treatment program, we sample every industry in the city. Once a year? Twice a year? I think it's once a year. Once a year. That's how we establish the baseline permit going forward. Yeah. And there's no fee for that. No. That comes under the. So, with this motion, it doesn't require us to charge a fee for something we're already doing for nothing. Is that right, Michael? Or? What have you roped us into? What have I roped us into? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we hadn't talked that part of it through. Yes. That's why um, I'm I, th I think, <laughs> as, as I think about it. fees have well, we're providing we're providing an annual service to many industries and not charging them, and so it seems to me that we're making the charge to Coca Cola, um, and we did it for Packaging Corporation and maybe some others because the intensity of the sampling and monitoring was much higher than once a year. Mm -hmm. Would you like staff to gather data on all the yeah. pre-treatment pro programs that we have in place with? All our customers, and come up with a con well, not, not a concept, but a, what we're spending or we're spending on resources for every facility in the city. Sounds good. I, I think it's uh, it's prudent to do that. Uh, I, I don't think we spend an awful lot of money on any one of the industries in the city. I think we go out there, we know what they're discharging. They're generally within. Uh, they're required, by the way, to do quarterly sampling with an outside company. And uh, we do it spot once a year just to check them. That's part of our pretreatment program. What I was going to say is that we would modify the saying from that there would not be any Cheshire baseline sampling. Yeah. Which would be the once a year. Yeah. However, if we saw a need to revisit it, then in that case it would be. I agree. And yeah. What I <clears throat> what I was imagining is that the, the vote that we just passed to allow the uh, staff to establish the fees that we could look at uh, the cost to do the baseline sampling or additional sampling, and you know make it a one every year. It's sort of like a <clears throat> this is somebody service. wants to uh, dig a hole, they are required to dig out a trenching permit. They want to use the sewer. They're, in fact, if you want to connect to the sewer, you have to. There's a sewer entry fee, I mm -hmm. believe. So mm -hmm. um, maybe this should be a new annual fee for huh. some of our, you know, our, our bigger customers. Well, let's let's get the data from the staff. Sure. Uh, okay. And just it seems to me that we've done the right thing mm -hmm. um, to to make this fee um, reflect our costs. It's generic, so that we could apply it mm -hmm. wherever it makes mm -hmm. sense. So I assume you don't want the staff to calculate the fee for Coca-Cola until we have all the information to you about all the other pre-treatment programs. Because that was your vote. But once we calculate that fee, it goes out as the next billing cycle. That was no, that's approved. I think that's okay. I think that's that's approved. approved. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I think I think what we're we know the that question number. is what about everybody else? Yeah. Okay. And maybe we should be Coming up with a, a, a reasonably a reasonable but new fee. And this information from SEA or yes. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, should help us clarify what we need to do with Williamsburg. Okay. <clears throat> Williamsburg has been um, sliding along. They have a small community system that discharges into our system. And we're four or five years past the length of, three years past the length of that contract. 
where we are since we upgraded it? No, it was the last time it was, it was issued in 77. It was a 78. It was a 30 year permit. Well, we went beyond the end of the year, but they were upgraded at one time. Not that I've been able to tell. I was going to say ask Peter McDuffie, but can't, we can't do that. Do that. Um, hmm. I know it's looked at once. I know it was. Wasn't there a discussion with them about was that lately about the water treatment plant and how that there's some the uh, drinking water plant has the capacity to uh, provide them with water. I think they said to do a water rate something. There's a something. backup water agreement with Williamsburg to be able to use our water system for fire protection. They can't currently use it for a potable source because they need a pump system to energize the system. There's just not enough pressure at down in Hayesville to provide them with water. But there is a agreement for backup use for fire protection off our hydrants. If that's what you're referring to, I I think it was something to do with actually uh, tax abatement or something that they wanted us to pay. There was more a taxes. pilot, and uh, the board agreed. They asked for. Um, Originally, they were looking to tax our new facility up there, right. That's and it's exempt there. from taxes. Yeah. So they came back and asked for a pilot of an additional, besides the uh, value of the land that we get taxed for, they asked for an additional $8,000 a year for fire and police services rendered, which the board agreed to. So above, above and beyond the land taxes, we're giving them an additional $8,000 a year right now for those services rendered. I think we're good, and, and so you're going to, when you have a moment, give some thought to uh, taking a look at the other industries that might fall under this. I'll give Charlene a call tomorrow, our pre treatment coordinator. Uh, next, and finally, the solid waste planning update. Which one do you want to do first? <laughs> solid planning update. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two committees operating. There's the board committee. Closure Solid Waste Management Program Committee. <laughs> Task Force. Task Force. Ad, ad hoc committee. We've only got five minutes, so. Right. It'll take that long to explain the name. <laughs> <laughs> did, well, did your committee ask for uh, an opportunity to. I'm on both, so I'm like, <laughs> I'll let you pick one. Do you want me to tell what our committee's doing, or do you want me to tell them what our committee's doing? It would be awesome if you could tell them what you're doing. Right. After four long and intensive meetings, at which time we asked the staff to prepare reams of backup data and calculations, the <coughs> post, <coughs> no, post landfill closure solid waste management program committee decided to maintain the status quo. Um, <laughs> For FY13, with one exception, and that is we strongly encourage the full board to adopt a means-based uh, discount system for the uh, land, the transfer station permit fee, as a, in lieu of the senior discount fee system that we have, mm -hmm. and we recommend that that be um, adopted so that it can go into effect for FY13. We considered many other things, including adjusting the sticker fee, and we decided that since the landfill will be in operation most of FY13, we ought to just leave things alone and revisit it um, next year. October. October. Of this year. Of this year. <laughs> what else? Is that close enough, Jim? It's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> nice. Wow. Nice. So, um... Star. This is, but this is not your formal. Uh, well, are you, are you saying that that committee is pretty much gone as far as it's going to go, and it's time to bring forward that motion? Yes. yes. Well, I think so because it's, uh, Karen, uh, Karen was a participant in the meetings, and she 
has the charge to bring forward the information that the board needs to implement the needs-based program, right? Well, we absolutely agreed that the, the needs-based yeah. uh, sticker would yeah. be we'd look to implement it for July 1st, but I... You think I we're going to do more work? Well, I, I think that the, the question that begs, you know, what, what are we going to look like in terms of solid waste when the landfill does close? And I think that it might be that we continue to operate as is and through what, next April, next mm -hmm. spring sometime. Yep. But then we're looking at the transition to the landfill being closed right. and what happens then. And we had a lot of discussions along those lines and we're getting close to some recommendations when we realized that it might be premature to put them in place this July. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? yeah, I think that the thought was that when we started up, I mean, the thought was that we'd be closing before, we'd be closing in the fall sometime, but as that deadline has evolved, um, I think that the, the com conventional wisdom of the group seems to be, let's, what, what do we really need to change and put in place? And as we looked at the things that um, might be the most challenging things to change, i.e. the sticker fee going from 25 to 75 a year, uh, felt like a big jump, so we decided that we would do the means-based uh, sticker this year and then look to have the transition next year so that if there is a sticker fee increase, we'll come up with that next year. So it would be fair to say Karen should pull it together and bring this forward as a something we can vote on? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for your yeoman service. In your woman's service. So we'll do another subcommittee in, uh, in October. Your words. Your words. Chris can be out of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, there's the other committee under this umbrella. That's true. And it's the reuse committee. And we met with them this morning. Um, we have the dream proposal, which we have not. No, we're going to bring it to the meeting on the 25th. It didn't get to the last, it's supposed to get to the last meeting and it didn't, and then it didn't get to the meeting for today. So, so we're on the agenda for the 20th. Yes, yes. <coughs> and the dream proposal is really what the uh, the working group that we have is looking to see what, what the, it's the dream of what they would like to see a reuse center to look like. Mm -hmm. We met with them this morning, made it very clear that it's not just a location and a reuse center, that there's a a program that goes along with that and brainstorm different ways that we might be able to accomplish it. They were clearly disappointed but not surprised that the Mass DOT site seems to be able to stall based on the environmental contamination. But I think we had some ideas on how we might set up something on an interim basis. And the, the group seemed to leave in good humor. Yes, and the only thing I'll add to that is that Jim and David Valletta and and Jay and I met on Friday, thanks for your support on that, and came up with the idea of potential um, um, uh, shipping container use as a beginning because the shed, the condition of the shed was such that we wouldn't want to spend any of our hard-earned uh, enterprise, enterprise fund money, whatever is left of that, on some of those sheds. But Jim is going to do some research in terms of city property on which possibly um, shipping containers could locate and or maybe even touch base on using the front of the DOT site um, as a potential location for um, shipping containers. Uh, and then we brought to the committee also the fact that the dream proposal as it is now uh, and as will be presented may need to be modified in terms of um, what's left over the, the, and um, uh, vetting of the, the, the materials that are, are put inside the reuse committee and a few other things that, that Jim and, and David brought up at our discussion. Mm -hmm. They were really good comments. So, Jim, for your final meeting. Oh, can I say one more thing? Um, we have taken to heart your comments about the traffic, and that has been a significant traffic at the Locust Street mm -hmm. transfer station, and we that has been a significant um, uh, input in our discussions. I, legitimately so, but I'm just saying. No, it, it sounded yeah. it when you were talking. Yeah. Containers down below, was yeah. it? 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No, what <laughs> yeah. I'm saying yeah. is it's more yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. what, the one other thing you didn't mention for the other committee is the discussion about the possibility of exploring Sunday hours for the transfer station. Sure. Or is that an October thing? Well, well I think we can, something why don't, we're why don't, um, The staff presented data that showed that um, approximately 80% of the um, residents that use our transfer facilities use Locust Street and only 20% use Glendale Road. And then as we were looking at um, some of the capital costs required at Glendale Road to run the facility on our own, um, they were fairly significant because the compactors and at least the compactors and compactors and boxes out there belong to the contractor, and so we'd have to replace those. And so we were wrestling with um, whether or not it was worth um, spending that money to equip Glendale Road to be used as a transfer facility after the landfill closes. And um, someone in the group. Um, suggested extending the hours at Locust Street instead and perhaps not using Glendale Road and the suggestion was um, look at Sunday hours um, at Locust Street and close Glendale Road and then that evolves into another whole discussion um, about leaf and yard waste and where can you deal with that and we at the moment want to provide that service to residents so that would be done at Glendale Road but select periods of time during the year, not all the time. And then we looked at all the difficult to manage waste that are only received at Glendale Road because of space requirements. And um, in, in I think every case that service is provided by Valley Recycling. And so the thought was if, if people, no, most people normally come here if they have a difficult to manage um, item like a, an appliance or a mattress, um, they would have to go someplace else anyway to get rid of it. And or either so they either drive to Glendale Road, so it didn't seem like a change or an additional inconvenience to drive down to Valley Recycling. So, so that's sort of the thought process that we went through, um, and so we're headed toward a recommendation to close. Um, Glendale Road, except for leafing yard waste. But um, yeah. we didn't find out any of that. No. That's Just an October decision? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. For a regeneration of the committee? I'm sure. Yep. The Sunday possibility came up because Wilbraham and I think another East oh, yeah. Longmeadow right. mm -hmm. have just recently started that, and apparently it's been well received. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So that takes some of the traffic, Saturday traffic, away from. And I know some of the hill towns do Sunday hours too. Nashville does. Yep, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. so that's too far to drive. familiar with the Mill River Greenway Initiative no. project? No. No. Um, and the, I don't even know what the organization is exactly. I think it's Federal Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program, possibly. Uh, something about invasive species. I don't know anything about that. There's something. There's a couple of things that just came up, and I, I don't really know what the responsibilities are that the DPW has regarding the Mill River, if any other than stormwater catch basins and point source pollution from into the Mill River. Is this the program where they want to divert the mill, well, a portion of the mill so that it runs down um, the old drainage, the old mill bed, uh, and uh, by the Mizanti walkway down there? It, it would include that. That's not really where I was going. The point is, is that there, there's, there's these different things going on. I'm not really sure what the key is. DPW has it in terms of interest or responsibility. But on Thursday night, next Thursday night from 7 to 9, the artist Christo 
will be the um, <laughs> kickoff Smith. speaker at Smith College. Will be the kickoff speaker for some kind of a rivers project, and it's hosted mm -hmm. by an organization called Rivers.org. Mm -hmm. The one on Colorado. Mm -hmm. I think That's so. right. Yeah, it's the right. Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. And it's but the conference is uh, I think it's mostly at UMass. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I thought for it was three at days. Smith. No, he's he's I I don't know why the thing is there, but. Um, I just thought it might be of interest. Mm -hmm. It's a 2000 seat auditorium. I have yeah. a feeling it's going to be packed. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's a two-hour thing. He's only going to speak for 45 minutes and ask questions and answers. Uh, it, and it's a fundraiser. I don't know. No, it's I'm free. You do have to you have to sign up in advance because yeah. there's only 2,000 seats, but you don't have to pay any money to go to go to to this to him speaking. Uh -huh. I think the conference you might have to pay money to go to. Is that the guy with the yeah. Yeah. In yeah. New York and sidewalks and, he's, he's and put city, pink Arkansas. Silk around islands. Yeah. Yeah. Down in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to cover the Arkansas River. There's a yeah. big ravine out there. Yeah. What's he going to do to us? Talk. Talk. <laughs> Probably take pictures. Makes money off of Cover the old Mill River bed through yeah. town. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so next Thursday, Smith they College. They cover it. They want to open it up. 79. Jimmy, is there anything that we need to talk about? Mike? Nothing. Yeah. Uh, a bu bunch of documents in the back of your board package. Uh, uh, thank yous from residents to us, promotions of employees to uh, dealing with a private way in the street with trees on it, um, which I took great interest in. Uh, a grant we were awarded by Maya for purchase of our, uh, two flammable storage cabins from next door as part of the last control program. And um, that's about it. Just want to make sure you recognize that. Okay. Thanks. Jim? I really enjoyed the discussion tonight about BOD and TSS. Is only an engineer could. Disappointed in the Red Sox start. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 The Tigers were tough. They, they, had, had, they, they, did. Did. they did win at least one game. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. They're in the hole already. Yeah. Four and one. BJ, how's your vacation? Your slides or anything you want to share with us? Or, uh, <laughs> Not right now. No? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next meeting. MJ? Stream flow with the Mill River and how it triggers our drought restrictions. When do we start monitoring that or do we do it on the calendar? Have we decided to do it on the calendar yet? No, it's done on the previous calendar year on a per capita basis consumption. We're still doing oh, a yeah. bit of this in the screen gauge. Starts. I'd have to check the date. It's like June 15th or something, so it's going to be cool. It just well, seems like river flows are extremely low. Yeah, most like, of the weather yeah. patterns change. I think we'll be in for, for water restriction for sure. How, how did we allow them to <laughs> set that? <laughs> I mean, what's it? How much time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got a lot of time. I'll tell you, that's a pet peeve of mine. They, you can circle back during the week, and I'm sure you understand. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've had some pretty lengthy discussions about that when we built the water restriction policy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Our members were called. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's clearly a controversial thing, not only in town but you know statewide. And and I mean, the reason I'm raising this is because it, it seems to me, just as a non-engineer, that the stream flow seems low right now, and and this is usually when it's rushing. Then what's it going to look like in the summer? It won't be any stream. Right. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, we always talk about the stream flow and how it's a bad benchmark for us to use and we should be using the reservoirs instead. But just to heighten awareness that I think people should really take to heart water restriction and mindful, good, prudent use of it early on. Yeah. Jim sent us a letter. I think a couple of years ago, or maybe it was only a year ago, it really explained it well, and the whole philosophy behind it. It's basically saying that what, what the wildlife regulation world is saying is that human beings are just one species on the face of the earth, and why do we get to keep all the water? So I think what, where that letter was going, or the, the regulation was going, is that even if our reservoirs are full, and the flow rates are down in the environment, there's no reason why we should then get to use all that water. In fact, I think they're saying is we should release some of that water. 
just, so let the I'm, environment I mean, my, my, my concern is that our reservoirs are going to be very low this summer. I think you're absolutely right. I, I, and I, think I that, believe that. That we should walk into the summer season with a uh, with a a very strong statement about we we're, we mean business this year. Mm. Well, I think that uh, we had the ability. This department has the ability to find people they never had. <coughs> But I think it's this may be the year. Well, from a policy perspective, we have talked about whether we ought to define just what it was, what it would be that we could do or should do. I don't think we've ever really had that conversation. Yeah. The uh, the water restriction policy did have some references to to the ordinance. The board has the ability to enforce the water restriction in certain activities. Um, so there's some discussion in there under the current ordinance, at least in terms of what can be done. Um, I think the first year or two, we've only had the water, the new water restriction policy for two years, and we've taken, we've tried to take more of an educational approach, we're trying to identify people that you know have had sprinklers going, and, and trying to tell them that they, you know, they need to comply with the, the uh, restriction. But I mean, at some point, you can go from sort of education to enforcement, and then we can review. You know what the fines would be. I don't recall exactly what they are. I need to review the policy, and would probably want to review any action that would take with the new city solicitor and make sure we're complying with what our what we're allowed to do under the ordinance. But yeah, I think those fines are laid out in the law, aren't they? They're in the ordinance. I, I want to yeah. see. I want, I want to see that a hundred dollars per yeah. fence. Yeah. Right. And who's the enforcement agent for that? DPW, water so. department. I I just. I, I think it's a really important issue that you guys are raising, obviously, but um, I'm always like prone to like not be for punitive right off the bat. I'm just wondering if there'd be a way to do some some sort of a PR thing where like if you if you lower your water consumption this year from what you had last year or something, and I don't know how you document it, but like maybe you get some local businesses to like have like a, a thing for dinner or something. I don't know, just something to sort of like maybe get everyone on board in a kind of a fun way. Like you know we're really going to be in this together, and let's I don't know just kind of in some way to entice people in a more positive way. I mean, you always have to have the punitive, but my, maybe it's the mother in me. Sorry. Step up distribution of water barrels and things like that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Water conservation kits? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. last year? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did that last year. Mm -hmm. Conservation kits. Boxes of them, so we can take another ad on the newspaper and we can do a little more promotion about things. Mm -hmm. I think it's. I think what you're suggesting is a good idea. You know, for yeah. We're coming into a dry year to do a little bit of outreach up front and, and try to set the stage. I think it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Jim, I have a, there's a guy um, I run into a lot on a couple of my customers' jobs who installs sprinkler systems. And he's always uh, asking me about whether there's some way for, he maintains that a high quality sprinkler system with uh, computerized controls actually is very efficient. Uh, but he feels like he's being lumped into people who just have a big wheel that they turn and the things run for hours. It's funny, I was at a, I was at a, a Waterworks uh, conference about a year ago, and one of the speakers was someone that was, sounds like he's in a similar business to this person that you know. And um, the person was up there talking about some of the sprinklers can be really high, re really high tech now. There's a lot of feedback and, and, and um, monitoring the amount of sprinkling that occurs and you know, so there's, there's, they're very, they're very, they're, they're systems that are designed to be more efficient for water use, basically. And at the conference, there was this guy up there, he gave a nice presentation. But the bottom line is, and I raised this question to him, and there were people from DEP at that meeting, that if you're in the city of Northampton and we have a water restriction, you can have the fanciest sprinkler system in the world and you can't use it. That's right. And that was... Uh, and, and our permit is not, you know, every, every town is a different permit. But uh, that was a real eye opener. I don't think he understood, you know, what I was saying. And that's, he just didn't understand it. And uh, the person from DEP in Boston that wrote our permit was there. And, you know, he didn't exactly raise his hand and start telling her, all the Waterworks people and suppliers and things in the room that, yeah, some of these permits are coming down that don't allow any sprinklers in the summer season if, it's, if you're in a defined drought condition. That's just that's the way some of these permits are written, and it doesn't take into account any of the technology that's available to make these sprinkler systems more efficient. 
So we have no real input on the way ours is written. No. So we're, we're actually installing drought resistant echo lawn at our habitat hub so can Garfield that. I think that's what the whole point of the regulation is, is that, you know, nature doesn't need green grass. Mm. I think that's where some of DDP policy is coming from as well. Yeah. I feel like it's a waste of use of water. I mean, if you talk right. to some people off the record within the department. Mm -hmm. right. You can get used to brown grass. Yep. Yep. I've got plenty of brown grass in my place. There'll be something else there eventually. Something that doesn't mind a little bit of dry weather. Yeah. yeah. David, was there anything you no, were hoping we would no. talk about? No? Nope. Nope. Motion we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone.